Okay, so what we're looking at right now are the types of alcohols that uh, exist, or should I say the categories that alcohols can kind of fall under. So they're classified basically um, when you're looking at the location of the hydroxyl branch or the OH group. So we kind of have three different types. We have primary, secondary, and tertiary. So this will become more important in later sections because what can happen is some of these, depending on the type of alcohol that is undergoing a reaction, you can have a different outcome and a different type of product that's made. So primary versus secondary um, would obviously have different outcomes. So it's important to kind of be able to classify and identify the type of alcohol we're dealing with. So a primary alcohol is one where you have the OH group on a carbon that has only one other carbon attached. Or you can think of it as the OH group is on a carbon that has two other hydrogens on it. So typically that's at the very end or beginning of um, a chain. Uh, so secondary is where you have two carbons that are attached to the carbon that has the OH. So it's always in reference to the carbon that has the OH group on it. So this carbon has two other carbons, or you can think of it as it has only one other hydrogen attached to it. So this is considered to be a secondary alcohol. A tertiary alcohol is when you have uh, the carbon that has the OH group on it, has three other carbon groups. So here I'm showing methyls, or uh, it doesn't matter what the items are for any of these. We're looking just at the carbon. So this could have been a cyclopropyl group. That doesn't matter. What matters is the carbon that has the hydroxide, how many other carbons are there? It doesn't matter what the carbon happens to be. So in this case, the carbon with the OH has three other carbons, or you can think of it as the carbon that has the OH has no hydrogens bonded to it. So this is considered to be a tertiary alcohol. So when you have an alcohol that has more than one OH group, it's known as what's called a polyalcohol. So meaning um, we have now um, poly meaning many uh, alcohols, which are the OHs. So the suffix will change depending on how many we have. It's very similar to when you had two double bonds. It would be considered to be a diene, or a, if you had three, a triene. Same deal here, it's just with the OL. So two OH groups would be considered to be a diol, we have a triol, or a tetraol, um, depending on what, um, how many OH groups you have. Now, just like when you're doing um, your two double bonds, you need to have a number for each carbon that the alcohol group is on. So even if it happens to be off the same carbon, you would still need to put that number down twice. So when you're naming polyalcohols, of course you would have the numbers indicating the OH group, but when you're actually doing the suffix, the E does not get dropped. So when you have a single hex, hexane with an alcohol, it's hexanol. So we drop the E of the hexene or the hexane. When you have two or more, the E remains. So if we had two OH groups on carbon one and carbon two, you one, two, hexane, diol. All right, so if we had it, let's say we had one on carbon one and two on carbon two, we'd say one, two, two, hexane, triol. Okay, so just be mindful when you're looking at multiple alcohols, don't drop the E from the name. So here are just a few examples. So here we have a simple ethane that has an OH on each carbon. So we have one, two, ethane, diol. So a lot of organic molecules, if you haven't noticed yet, um, can go by alternate names uh, that are not IUPAC naming. So for example, 1,2-ethane diol is also known as ethylene glycol. Um, same down here where we have, this is propane, uh, but propane has an OH group here on each of the carbons. So it's 1,2,3-propane triol. This is also known as glycerol or glycerin. 
Uh, so you may be familiar with this um, term or you've come across this term maybe in biology class. So um, obviously when I'm asking you to do naming, I'm not concerned with you knowing the uh, common name. I'm looking for the IUPAC naming system. There are going to be some molecules coming up uh, in the next chapter where we will look at common names and things, some things that you should know. Uh, but for now, right, we're doing IUPAC only. All right, so pause the video and give this a try. So I want to know the IUPAC name for the following compound. Okay, so hopefully you got this correct. So we have two, three, dimethyl, one, pentanol. So five being the parent chain. So we want the longest continuous chain that has that OH group on it. Obviously, we start counting closest to the OH group. In this case, it's on carbon number one. So that's our one pentanol. And then we have two methyl groups, so carbon two and carbon three. Give this next one a try. So pause the video, give that a try. So there's actually two ways to approach this that have um, different IUPAC names that are both acceptable. And the reason why we have multiple correct answers here is because there are two ways of kind of getting the same parent chain. So we'll go through each of these. So for example, the OH we know has to be part of the parent, right? And we know we're gonna start counting closest to this OH. So no matter what, this down here is gonna be carbon number one. So we could do it like this, okay? So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So that would make it three, Right here's one, two, three, three octanol. And then this branch right here is actually an isobutyl branch, right? One, two, three, four, but it has the orientation of an isobutyl on carbon five. So that would be this one down here, okay? But if we were to start counting and go the other way, so no matter what, this is gonna be one, two, three. But let's look at the other way, the opposite way. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So it's also three octanol. But instead of having that isobutyl, here we have a propyl group, right? One, two, three, and a methyl group. So in this case, if one of these directions was longer than the other, so let's say one side was octanol, but the other one was heptanol the octanol would be your parent group. But because they happen to be the, both in the same um, longest parent chain, you can do either one. Okay, so cyclical alcohols is where you have um, a fused structure um, where you have um, an OH group on it. So a lot of these are large molecules and a lot of them go by common names that are not IUPAC. So these are just some examples. Uh, again, you're not gonna, I'm not gonna say cholesterol and ask you to draw this for me, absolutely not. Um, we're always dealing with IUPAC, but it's just good to know that these types of things exist, right? So you have cyclo groups that have OH groups on it. Some of them can be very large um, and we're not gonna go through the naming system, especially for something like cholesterol, um, not at this level of organic chemistry. Now, aromatic, where we have a benzene ring, Benzenes are a, a funny thing. Okay, when benzenes have different functional groups on it, it changes names. So we saw that already with um, when it's a branch, it's a phenol group, right? Um, with the YL, phenol branch. In this case, uh, it's going to change its name again. So the OH group still takes priority. So wherever on the benzene that OH group is, it's number one. So you can have other things off of here as well. But this entire compound is known as phenol, O-L. So it's actually assumed that this, uh, this OH group is carbon one. So by simply writing phenol, it is assumed to be this structure where you have a benzene OH group on carbon one. So let's say we had um, a benzene group with an OH here and let's say we had uh, a bromine over here. So this would actually be, so one, two, three, three bromo, 
phenol. Okay, it's assumed to be number one. Now, if you put number one, so if you said three bromo uh, one phenol, okay, no marks will be docked here because this is still correct. Um, it's just more information that happens to be necessary. So both of these would be correct. Okay, so reactions. So alcohol reactions, um, or actually we're going to look at um, either alcohol as being a product where we're going to make alcohol, or if we're going to react to alcohol on the reactant side to do something for us. There are three that we're going to be looking at, and actually we've already looked at two of the three. So hydration, which is an addition reaction with water, actually will produce uh, an alcohol. So it produces uh, an OH group. Combustion reactions, because alcohols are made up of carbons, hydrogens, and oxygens, we can have them undergoing complete combustion, which we've already looked at at the very beginning of our reaction sections. And elimination reactions is going to be something that is new for us here. So elimination can also be known as dehydration. So you're going to notice the outcome is going to be kind of the opposite of hydration. Uh, but the conditions that are required are a little bit different, so we'll go through that. All right, so just quickly, here is an, another example of our hydration. So remember Markarnikov's rule, so when you're breaking a double or triple bond, the hydrogen goes to the carbon with more hydrogens, the OH will go to the other carbon. So here we have 2-propanol, right, just a simple little alcohol. Combustion, right? So complete combustion is always assumed. So here you have uh, propanol and we have oxygen making water and carbon dioxide uh, both in the gaseous form. So of course, these are the types of reactions you have to remember to balance and consciously add in your coefficients. So here's our, our new reaction for today. So elimination reaction involves the elimination of a water molecule from an alcohol. So in this case, alcohol is a reactant. So as I mentioned, it also can be considered a dehydration reaction. Actually, any reaction that is removing water from a molecule can be considered to be dehydration. So um, this does have some catalysts that are required. Okay, so again, I don't expect you to know the catalyst. Um, but just so you know, this is a relatively stable structure. We have all sigma bonds. So in order for this to actually react, there does need to be some amount of um, energy or um, catalyst added. So in this case, what's happening is the OH is removed and the hydrogen from a nearby carbon, so it's either the carbon to its left or to its right, the hydrogen gets removed. The reason why it has to be to its left or to its right is because once these are gone, each carbon is now lacking a bond. So in order to stabilize its, itself and create still the octet uh, of electrons, it will then create a carbon-carbon multiple bond. So this can actually undergo dehydration twice, but it would need to have another OH group on here. So for example, let's say we had another OH and an H, we technically could react this again and create it from, go from a double bond into a triple bond situation. So here we go, so an example, so we have one propanol. So the only spot to remove a hydrogen from would be um, from the carbon to its left here, because this is at the end of the chain. And then of course, so what happens is we have water as a byproduct and then we have a double bond. So it's the opposite of hydration, right? Dehydration. All right, so we'll pause the video and we'll have a fresh new part for our ethers.